A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the presidential panel at the Blitz Strategic Forum. I'm really very honored that two presidents, female presidents, accepted my invitation to come to Blitz and share the knowledge they possess. I would like to introduce to you Maya Sandu, the president of Moldova. Katerina, I will not say your second name again because I had to practice yesterday for the speech and I was okay, but today I wouldn't dare to say it again. The president of the Hellenic Republic, dear, Helena, uh, dear Katerina, welcome. <laughs> Dunja Miatovic, my dear friend for many, many years. I don't know what, what was the time when we first met, but I presume it was around 20 years ago. We were both dealing with human rights, Dunia for all of her professional life. Now I changed to another profession, but still human rights are deep down in my heart. Dunia is now holding a position of the Commissioner of Human Rights at the Council of Europe. <clears throat> I have decided this year to ascend the problems that the youth, the young generation, has in not just on the Western Balkans. We have to be aware that even countries inside European Union are facing the brain drain. And this is the problem we all have to be aware of. And that's the reason why I invited three young people. Mirjana, from originally, I have to say originally from North Macedonia, because I do know that deep down in their hearts, despite the fact that they left their own countries, they still feel the nationality that they originally belong to. So welcome, Mirjana, from North Macedonia. <clears throat> Nina is from Montenegro. Welcome, Nina. And the only man in our panel. <laughs> I mean, it's so nice, you know, for me to have not even gender equality, not even gender parity, but majority of women today. That was deliberately done. But I think that you will enjoy the debate uh, no matter what. Vehit from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Welcome. We do have one hour and 15, and I have to say I will be sharp on time because afterwards I have other obligations, uh, a lot of bilateral talks, but one hour and 15, I think that we will all enjoy the debate. Uh, we will try to be sharp and punctual. I really do hope that at the end I will have time to offer you a possibility to ask uh, questions. I will start with a number. From 1990 until today, Four million people emigrate from the states of the Western Balkans. That's the size of two Slovenias. And if this is not going to wake us up, I don't know what will. And in this panel, I would like to discuss why the young people are leaving their own countries. And even more important, why are they not returning back? I do understand you know, that people want to go to study abroad, maybe the topics, the subjects which are not available in their home countries, but most of them, unfortunately, do not return back. We have one example here, and I will start with you, Nina, because Nina left the country, came back to try to help her own country to develop, to become different, but she emigrated again. Maybe some of the stories you are going to hear in this panel are in a way sad, but these young people will tell us to our faces today what the reasons are. Maybe we are not aware enough of what's going on in their heads because, for example, I'm 55 years old. I can easily tell my age. I never left my country. I didn't have to, and I cannot imagine the reason for myself or for my son, for example, who's 22, to leave Slovenia. But these three young people will explain what was the background of their heart. Not easy decision. Nina, please tell us your story. 
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Nina. I come from Montenegro, uh, from a very diverse family and a very di diverse environment, the city I come from. Uh, to answer your question directly now, uh, after the, uh, so I, I lived, uh, lived in Ljubljana, I studied here, uh, obtained my master's degree, then I moved to Vienna, Austria, and there I worked at the university, and after the COVID crisis started, it found, I found it a little bit too hard to stay there. Uh, it is not easy to move to a different country, uh, to obtain a visa year after year, to find a circle of friends, to, to, to find a job, and especially when, it's, uh, when we have this hardship of a uh, pandemic. Additionally, so I did move back to my country, country and I moved back with an open heart. I um, wanted to give it a chance to try to, to, to just to, simply to have my mind clear, so I did try. Uh, so I did not have any prejudices, I came back, but I found what I found that I did not feel, um, let's say, I did not say, uh, I did not feel very appreciated and I did not feel even, a, even to say I did not feel comfortable uh, at one point staying there. Uh, I was dissatisfied with job opportunities that were given to me. I cannot say that they were not, but uh, the, the sense of belonging and the sense of purpose I did not have. Uh, so I decided to uh, migrate again and I then went back to Vienna. That's my short answer to this question. So sense of belonging and a purpose is what was lacking. But what do you think in your country should be changed in order for you to return again? Or you just gave up on your country? Because the, the, the fact that it's often bothering me, when people leave, most of them they leave forever and, and they just forget about their homeland. And from abroad, I know it's really very difficult to help. But I think David, you wrote a very important sentence in your uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I will use it now if you don't mind. He said that the young people in Bosnia and Herzegovina are blaming those who left, and young people who left Bosnia and Herzegovina are blaming those who stay and don't do enough. So what's the biggest challenge and problem in Montenegro? And you don't have to be politically correct. The presidents have to be, you don't have to. Thank you for that, yes. Uh, so, to answer your question, the answer is twofold. What would I need to return uh, at this point? And, and I don't, really don't like to be definitive in my opinion, so I, I'm not gonna say I will never return to Montenegro. It's my country, my family lives there. Uh, of course, I, did not, I do not want to, uh, of course I want to, uh, to, to return at one point, but this point is not now. Uh, and to answer a question, I can answer with three, three, three different things that I think that could improve and have potential to better the situation. First of all is, of course, education. Uh, you need to give the talented individuals the sense of purpose so that in order for them to stay. If not, they will, of course, seek for the better opportunities abroad, and nobody can blame them for this. Uh, second of all, I'm sure that both of them is, are also going to say this, uh, endemic corruption that we have, uh, nepotism, and I believe that merit-based approach would be a better, 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 better solution, of course, uh, to give those who deserve, to give them, give them a chance to stay. stay. And, the second, sec uh, and the third thing uh, that I would like to mention is this uh, constant politicization of the national identities that we have. We had a plethora of, of nationalistic speeches uh, in the Western Balkans, of course, everywhere, but I'm just more interested in the region. And I believe that this divisive rhetorics of us versus them, always us versus them, is not something that is helping young people who want to actually escape this, this atmosphere stay. So we need to foster a more, for me especially, uh, we need to foster a more inclusive dialogue. And uh, if those three things could change and better, I would, of course, as I said, I don't want to be definitive, I would, of course, re reconsider going back to Montenegro and trying to, trying to live there. But be, be, uh, if that wouldn't change, I would not do that before it because, yeah. Mirjana, now it's your turn. <laughs> Despite the fact that you live in Slovenia right now, and I'm happy and proud that you choose my country to, you know, aspire uh, and, and, and fulfill your goals, uh, but on the other hand, I am sad because you left the country that I do like and love, like all the Western Balkan countries. I was working in those countries, you know, for many years and I have, I've seen many, many 
bright young individuals uh, or young politicians or even older ones who do want to, to, to do something. So share us your experience. What was a push in your case that you left North Macedonia? Thank you. It's a great honor and I feel really humbled to be with all of you here today. Um, so the main reason I decided to leave Macedon North Macedonia and uh, come study abroad to Slovenia was actually the socio-economic um, sur surroundings of the country at that time and uh, definitely the political discourse, which sadly is still the same. I've been living here in Slovenia for 15 years now and still um, the political discourses that, um, that are active in the Balkan countries, especially in, in my uh, home country, um, is populism, uh, nationalism, nepotism. So at the time when I, was, when I was 18 years old, the only way that you can prosper and that you can become something um, in my home country was to belong to the um, right or the certain political um, establishment. So this was the only way. Uh, no merit-based system, no space for um, critical constructivism, um, actually no space to um, express your just your uh, freedom. So these were very strong uh, factors that influenced me to, um, to leave the country. And sadly, I was not an excluded case. Here, I would also like maybe to, to state out an interesting fact that we have this, as I call it, a paradox of the Balkan parents, which actually support children to go abroad because they believe that they will have better opportunities abroad. I mean, some people say that we are the generation of mobility. But I do believe, speaking from my personal experiences, is that my moving abroad was more a necessity than a mere opportunity. So this would, in shortly, be the main reasons why I decided to, to move to Slovenia. I have to ask you, do you have any plans to return to North Macedonia? Um, I should relate here with Nina. I, I do not like to, to make definite de decisions, but I must say that it's a, it's a personal mind, milestone that I acquired my Slovenian citizenship in 2018. It's been um, not easy path, it's been a difficult road, but here currently I am fulfilled. This, was, this is the place where like, I found myself, so I don't know, I'm really sad that my country did not offer that, and now that I'm developing professionally and personally um, in another country, but I can say I'm lucky I have two countries. <laughs> You said that you acquired a, a Slovenian citizenship in 2018. Sorry to ask, but was this a sad or a happy day for you when you took an oath um, to the Slovenian constitution? <laughs> yes, it was one of, I guess, one of the most emotional days. Um, I gave the oath um, at, on my birthday, so the symbolics were, <laughs> were there. Um, I was very happy, I must say. Um, there were tears, but mostly of happiness. Um, I mean, this, this, getting the Slovenian citizenship does not mean that I stop being Macedonian. I cannot change who I am, and I'm proud of it. I'm really proud of my Balkan upbringing. But f for the time being, this is where I'm living, and I'm happy with my choices, and I'm happy that I'm part of a country where I'm accepted for who I am. So it was a happy day. Thank you, Mirjana. Behit. The only man in the panel. <laughs> um, but I will ask you this question. Is it harder for women in Bosnia and Herzegovina than for men to be successful? Yes. <laughs> okay, short answer. <laughs> You're a man. And despite that, that it's easier for men, you left the country. Tell us, please, your reason. My reason? Okay. Uh, excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, um, I will start by saying that this is the biggest honor in my life to be here with you today, but yet I would exchange it in a blink of an eye just not to be here. Uh, I come from the most complicated, but still most entertaining country in the world, <laughs> uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yesterday we heard that it's Montenegro. It's oh. the land of sun and fun. <laughs> we are competing. Uh, what, why did I left? But I actually never left. I'm still there and I will always be. Uh, we have to be aware that, I mean, I will be direct. I hope that you will grant me an immunity maybe for this, but we are one of the most Granted. corrupt, oh, sorry. Uh, 
We are one of the most corrupt societies in the world. My people, we are, we are cursed with corruption immediately upon birth, as parents have to bribe public doctors so their newborn babies have to receive proper care. And those babies have to spend the rest of their lives trying to wash down the invisible stains of corruption. Now, for, for girls, it's even harder. They mentioned corruption, they mentioned nepotism. Corruption and nepotism, yes, but the, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have even bigger problem when it comes to jobs, so I will go straight to jobs for young people. Because in order to get a prosperous, stable job in my country, you have two options. One is to become a member of political party, which is not a problem in most countries, right? But in my country, we are three major nationalistic political parties that are constantly spreading spe uh, hate speech and uh, nationalism and trying to divide instead of reconcile this population. This option, this choice, represents a suicide of humanity. You have to kill all of your beliefs and believe me, you have to be ready to turn away your head from more than 50% of your countrymen. I couldn't do that. The second option is what Nina and Mirjana mentioned. And yes, young people in my country, they tried. My co-thinkers, my students, my friends, some of them tried. Eventually they left, but you can blame them or not. Some were afraid for security, some simply didn't want to raise their children in a society where your name is, takes precedence over your ideas, your knowledge, and your beliefs. And uh, interestingly so, all of them, most of them, more than 90% chose European Union as their new home because that is the place where they could protect, rebuild, and foster those values that they were protecting from, from our society. That is why I said that we are one of the most corrupt societies in the world, and I think that Ms. Dunya would definitely agree with me here on, on this one. But if I may, you ask me, why did I leave? I never left my country. I mean, I left five times, <laughs> but uh, only to get knowledge and to learn things that could improve the situation in my country. Because I feel every human being in my country. I use this term intentionally, because if I say that I that I feel citizens, some will be left out. If I say that I feel only my people, because of my name, probably two other ethnicities will be left out. So I feel our suffering, I feel our confusion, but there is a way out. I mean, things can change easily. It is my responsibility, it is my duty, it is the duty of, of young people. And, uh, but I'm here and I speak for those who left and for those who stayed. It is interesting that my people never consider me diaspora simply because I never gave up on my country. I don't want to speak bad things only with smart people about my country. I can say bad things. But uh, the thing is that uh, I'm here for those young people. We ask for your help, patience, guidance. We look upon you. And uh, after all, we come to you day by day in huge numbers, but we would, most of us would rather visit you as friends and tourists. So I hope that you will, you will take this into account. Thank you. You know, when we had a conversation a couple of days ago preparing for this uh, panel, um, you said to me that your first trip abroad was, above all, China. You didn't go to the European Union country, but to China. Why China? And most of all, I would like you to tell me the story about people from Western Balkan countries being together in China. You didn't care about nationality and ethnical origin. You were there as a group. But whenever you come back to Bosnia and Herzegovina, this unity is just gone. Mirena, if I may, that is another paradox of, of, of Western Balkans. Uh, we always find strength when we are abroad. And we don't care about names, ethnicities, our passports. We don't care about anything. We, we can be ourselves in other countries. Why China? Uh, because 
I saw that many left to European Union, but few, I, I, would, I could even say none came back to help to change the situation. I thought maybe there is a different set of values that I could, I'm not talking about political values, but I'm talking about values that uh, you mentioned yesterday, solidarity, trust, something that maybe could be rebuilt in some other countries. I left to China and I met amazing people. I, le and I met people from all around the world and uh, yes, I'm still in those groups and we have groups, for example, uh, Balkan in China. Uh, we have Serbs in China where I am one of, of administrators of that group. We have, uh, we have Bosnian and Herzegovinas in, uh, Herzegovinians in, in, in China, but we don't have that in our constitution and so on and so on. But I learned a lot there. I came back and uh, just, just because I saw that there is a way out, we just need to rebuild that trust. And believe me, yesterday on, the, on, the, on that conference concert, I almost cried just for that video for trust. And you see that the video is, I think, from 2014, so we are already late, 10 years, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's the right time now that I pass the words to Dunja because the connection with Vehid uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, you are from Bosnia and Herzegovina, is a natural one. You are, you know, working in the field of human rights for decades. You dedicated your life to human rights. And whenever we had a discussion, Dunja, you were always... Uh, I always felt that you are, sh you are still strongly connected to your homeland, despite the fact that you left many years ago. But you are going back regularly, but it's uh, maybe you know, one of your duties to go back. You go to many countries. So from the perspective of the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, uh, how do you see the progress in the countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Western Balkan countries, Moldova, Ukraine. We will discuss this with uh, my honorable guest, uh, Her Excellency Maya Sandu later on. Katerina will, will, will share the knowledge that she possesses about uh, Western Balkan and European Union issues regarding uh, youth. So if we discuss human rights, do we only see problems year after year or is this beautiful convention on human rights that we have inside the Council of Europe member states doing any good to our society? I wish you will say yes because I am a strong believer in human rights but walking around different countries seeing human rights and dignity just washed down, washed down the toilet it hurts me a lot, and I presume it hurts you even more because it's your job to help. Please tell me your point of view, and of course, connect your uh, reasoning to the uh, young people of Europe. Thank you. Thank you, President, and thank you for inviting me. I'm really grateful for the opportunity also to return to uh, Slovenia and to BLADE, I think I attended one of the first BLADE strategic uh, forums when we were still discussing the future also of the Western Balkans and um, trying to see the resolutions uh, in a very complex situation. Listening to this amazing um, young people, um, I can just uh, you know, confirm what they said and it's based uh, on my work, uh, my trips, uh, um, anything I do, I do by talking to people. Um, I do listen, of course, to the politicians, uh, I speak to the institutions, but people are the ones, ordinary people, are the ones that are actually giving me the pulse on what is wrong in certain societies. Um, and in order to, to answer or to try to answer some of your questions or some issues that I wanted to raise today. I, I have to be, <clears throat> but it's not unusual for me, like non-diplomatic uh, um, in, in addressing these issues if we want to hear what's really happening in our societies. And I 
do not think I need to tell you more because most of you attended leaders' panel yesterday. I left, I was poisoned with the attitude of our leaders. I could not grasp the way they were addressing their voters, their audience, their host. And I'm grateful to see Prime Minister Kurti here listening uh, to us today. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there are more politicians here, but I didn't see any. Because it's not a joke. It's not about joking what's happening in the Western Balkans. It's dangerous what is happening. And President Sandu can talk about the danger of the influence of uh, the Russian Federation and the way it's coming softly inside. It was already there long ago. So in order to say all these things, I also have to take off my commissioner's hat and to talk as a proud Sarajevan, as a person from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I definitely always stayed connected, and I will stay connected uh, to my country, uh, because it is my country, and I'm very proud of it, regardless of the politics uh, that is uh, ongoing at the moment. And that's the reason, that attitude, the way um, the politicians talk to each other, the way they address issues, is the reason young people are leaving. Let's be honest. In addition to this, there are no jobs. There are no possibilities for them to expand their sort of, you know, interests, you know, to see themselves as a free uh, citizens living in a democratic world. People always migrated. During the former Yugoslavian time, you know, people were leaving. My parents left for Austria. I mean, that, that is a normal thing. You cannot stop people leaving. But the reasoning um, at the moment is quite uh, different. And uh, when talking about human rights, it is true, and you rightly just stated, that human rights are becoming something that is almost untouchable in certain discussions. Here at Blade, we are talking about global security. But where are the human rights? The basic of everything that we established and that we call democracy. <coughs> and in order to live in democracy, you need to pay a price. And that price is also human rights for all, for each and everyone, not just particular groups. Why we have this situation even within the European Union? Your foreign minister yesterday said it very clearly. It's populism. It's the far right. It is the way you know, certain things are addressed. We can ask ourselves, why are people dying at our shores in our continent, Europe? Why are people beaten at the borders of different skin color? Why do we have women's rights attacked in the countries that are calling themselves democracy? Why we are chasing LGBTI community in many of uh, uh, European states? So it is more than just Western Balkan. But the Western Balkan is very significant within the Europe, within the European uh, infrastructure and architecture. And young people that are living there are contributing to the overall success of many countries. Of course, they want to return. I returned on many occasions, and then I went. Uh, and I left exactly because of those reasons, because I didn't want to declare myself um, to belong to certain uh, you know, ethnical or political group, because I wanted to be independent, and I could not. And I found a way to be independent by working for international organizations without political support of particular political party of my country. But that's just you know, one example. What I think is also extremely important is to find a way to reach out to young people to win hearts and minds. And we cannot win hearts and minds without talking about human rights. We need to return in believing in human rights, because everything starts from that point. We cannot talk about economy, about progress, but saying, you know, let's put human rights on a side. Western Balkan is the region that is still glorifying war criminals. Western Balkan is the region where you still have 
denial of genocide, for example, denial of genocide that happened in, in Srebrenica. So how we can talk about anything that is called progress and moving towards um, uh, European Union when those issues are not even partially tackled. So there is just sticking the box and not actually working on making sure that there is a true path to the reconciliation and also talking about the truth. So sometimes, you know, we need to be very direct and very honest when talking about these things. Of course, you know, we do not want to be just critical, but how can you address those issues and trying to sugarcoat the problems that are deeply ingrained in the society uh, that is very much hurt and it needs to heal and to reconcile? And it can only do this by people being able to return and to engage. And, you know, as you said, you worked in many parts. And when I travel, I just came from Montenegro, where I have roots. Uh, and I'm traveling to all the places. You know, I feel at home. You know, I'm, I'm here at home. I'm not a citizen of Slovenia. But I feel this as my country. This is something that stayed from, you know, time before I was recently uh, in Kosovo, uh, meeting uh, uh, government and civil society, I felt at home. You know, so it's it's uh, for all of us. Uh, I do not think it's a problem in engaging, in talking, even if it is different language or you know slightly different culture. Uh, but what is very problematic is the attitude of our governments and politicians towards people, um, towards young people, towards. Uh, you know, people that are critical of their work, um, people that do not believe that they will do something good, and that's why they are leaving. So the question yesterday, I would ask it, I was able to moderate, is, okay, they are leaving, but why? You know, they are working as waiters, which there is nothing wrong with this, uh, in different countries. Um, they are, you know, there are people traveling and, and looking for jobs, that's fine. But the question is more why, and it's not something that I think is funny, uh, it is showing the reality uh, of the way uh, Western Balkan is uh, actually um, doing at the moment, uh, and I do not think it's rosy uh, at all. Uh, uh, Dunya, before I pass the word to uh, my dear colleague Maya Sandu, uh, we were now discussing the Western, ba Western Balkans, but you as the Commissioner for Human Rights for all 47 member states of Council of Europe, you have a wider picture of various problems around Europe. Um, Western Balkan seems to be a big problem, also regarding human rights. What about the rest of Europe? Can you just tackle a bit, maybe a connection to Moldova, Ukraine, Russia's out for you know obvious reasons. Uh, but as far as I know, Russia was uh, the record holder of the lawsuits before the European Court of Human Rights. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, despite the fact that we in Europe have a European Convention on Human Rights since 1953, it still seems that there are just problems, problems, problems. I will just tell you one story. When I was working in Belgrade, I took a taxi from the airport downtown and the taxi driver asked me, uh, we were chatting, you know, what's my field of work? And I said, oh, I deal with human rights. And he said, I will tell it in Serbian right now and then I will translate. Što više ljudskih prava, to više sranja. It's not easy to translate in English, <laughs> but more human rights we have, more problems are occurring. I do not want to believe, you know, that this is really... <laughs> People are laughing because I didn't translate directly, I know, because most of you do understand Serbian, but so I was uh, politically correct. So, Dunja, from 1953 until today, do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? It's not going to be perfect. Never. I'm aware of that fact. But the violations that we are facing today in a modern society, it's just one sentence I can say. I simply do not understand. What's the reason? Are so many bad people walking around this planet? Please, the rest of the Europe, where do you see us? Where is Europe 
going regarding human rights? It's a big, it's a million dollar question, um, but um, I'm still hopeful and I'm still optimistic, otherwise I would probably not be able to do this job. Um, but you mentioned Moldova, um, and um, you know we started with the Western Balkan, and of course you know that's something that is a topic of, of this panel. But at the same time, you know I think Western Balkan also needs to understand, and the leaders in the Western Balkan, that we are just a drop of the pro you know of all the problems happening uh, in Europe uh, and beyond. Uh, you just need to go to a um, country that is bordering. Uh, um, uh, Ukraine, uh, and that's uh, Moldova. Um, the president will talk uh, more, but I was there many times uh, in, during my um, uh, career, um, and I was there uh, in March, at the beginning of March 2022, just after the full invasion started in order to start um, working with the refugees from Ukraine and people leaving the country because of the war. And I, I went to the border um, in uh, Odessa Oblast. Uh, uh, there is a border called, um, I forgot the name now, but it's a uh, you know, very um, you know, important place because people from Mykolaiv and from the regions that were hit um, badly at the very beginning of the war started coming to small Moldova, um, where people showed enormous solidarity um, and uh, the way of, of um, you know, taking care of your neighbor and, and showing that, yes, they can do it and they are still doing it. Immediately afterwards, I went to um, Ukraine, I went to <clears throat> Bucha and Borodyanka just after the Russian troops uh, pulled out um, in order to see what can be done uh, together with my team um, to cover issues related to human rights. Uh, but it is complex and it is very um, problematic uh, to uh, give answers on you know, direction we are heading to. Um, when it comes to migration, I ask myself, are we becoming a fortress Europe? Uh, is this going to change you know, um, the way we are thinking uh, about uh, um, our continent? Uh, when it comes to women's rights, you know, I'm asking myself why suddenly uh, women cannot um, access basic sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, after decades of uh, enormous success. When it comes to LGBTI community, I'm asking myself why we are suddenly again chasing uh, people, not to mention transgender uh, rights. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a pot of, of, uh, that is really, it's almost like a pressure cooker. Um, uh, when I see what happens to people in different uh, member states of the Council of Europe. But still, there are leaders and there are ones that are holding a torch of human rights, and here I'm talking about young people because they ask me for more and not less human rights. So they are my kind of compass in, in addressing the issues uh, and, and doing my job because they do not want to live in some kind of fortress. They do not want to live uh, with wires and walls, concrete or electronic. They want to live in a free society, in uh, the open society that uh, gives opportunities. Of course, safety is important, security is important for citizens. You know, it's a legitimate right of the government to protect people. But it is not an excuse to continue putting pressure on human rights. And that's why, you know, Council of Europe has a role. You said Russia was expelled, but not the Russian people. We are still working with human rights defenders, with journalists, you know, with many uh, people that are also working in Ukraine and trying to help their, their colleagues. So we need to keep the bridges open for the future, uh, which is also the role of the international organization. Multilateralism is something that I think also needs to be promoted more than ever before. Thank you, Dunia. Madam President, Moldova, I, when I'm, you know, listening to you, I often hear the sentence that you are grateful to Ukraine because Ukraine is def defending on your behalf as well uh, the values of European way of life, youth in your country. 
you're a politician for many years already. You've seen everything in your country. You're now the president and you have to be a kind of a mediator between different political opinions. How much of your time you dedicate to young people and what's the main problem for young people in your country? Thank you very much. Uh, you know that two days ago we celebrated Moldova's Independence Day <clears throat> and we reminded ourselves what independence, what democracy, because even though Moldova's democracy is still fragile, but the independence brought democracy to Moldova and what it means for us. And of course it means freedom of speech, freedom of criticizing the government and the politicians. It also means the freedom of um, uh, traveling and of leaving the country. And I just want to add to the statistics that uh, you uh, brought here today. In the last three decades, we saw one million people leaving Moldova. And of course, many of these people are young people. And just to put uh, the figure into a context, Moldova has today around 2.6 million people living in the country. So a million people abroad is a lot of people. And these are young, uh, courageous people. These are people who believe in democracy. And they actually do help us with elections because uh, <clears throat> many Moldovans, sorry, <clears throat> despite the fact that they live abroad, they do participate in the elections. And to me, this is a clear sign that they didn't give up on their country. They are very much interested in what's happening in the country and uh, trying to participate in, in uh, uh, defining the future of the country. But this is a big issue, and even though uh, the rate of migration is smaller now than before, but people continue to leave. And it's, it's basically the, uh, the young people who continue to leave the country. Why they do leave uh, the country? Because of several reasons. Because of the lack of economic opportunities, and this was a very big issue in the past, because of the transition, because of the prolonged and difficult transition to, uh, to the market economy. Uh, they do continue to live now. For instance, every time I meet with uh, people in the uh, diaspora, I meet people who try to uh, do business at home and they failed, and who are very successful in doing business in many EU capitals, which means that they're very good, that they have the entrepreneurial spirit if they managed in a foreign country to be successful. And it means that the problem is at home with our business environment, with our institutions, uh, some of which still harass the businesses and don't understand that uh, the economic development means uh, supporting businesses and creating the right environment. Uh, freedom. Uh, we do have uh, people who left during the darkest times of our history when we had regimes which were trying to become authoritarian. <coughs> regimes, governments, which didn't respect the basic human rights. And that's why many young people, since they have the choice, they, they just left to live in countries which respect their uh, human rights. The education is an issue. Uh, we have brilliant young people who leave Moldova to study in the best European or world universities. And they are just making the best decisions for themselves because education is, is the most important investment. So this is just pointing to the fact that our university education is not good enough. And we have to work much harder because once these uh, young people leave for universities, um, it would be good if they would come back. But they are not coming, or very few of them are coming back. So there is plenty of issues we uh, have to work on, and of course, we started to work on, on these issues, but we understand that we'll have to make a critical mass of improvements across the board to change things for better uh, with respect to human rights, with respect to meritocracy, as, as you put it, with respect to the business envi environment, uh, with respect to the quality of health and education and so on, to become, to be more credible uh, for the young people to decide to stay in Moldova. So it's, it's not easy, um, and you're right, a lot depends on the quality of the government policies. And I just want to uh, speak a little bit about my own example, because I did leave the country at some point. I was planning to go to study abroad, but I was always busy. But at some point, I, just, I was so disappointed with the political developments in my country 
that I thought that this is the right time to leave. So even though I had the plan to go to study, but what pushed me was really the political developments at home. So I left uh, to study abroad, and then I found a job uh, abroad to be able to repay my uh, credit uh, for the university uh, costs. And uh, after a couple of months, uh, uh, sorry, after a couple of years, I was thinking whether I should stay abroad or I should try to go back again. And I felt that I want to give uh, myself a chance, one more chance, to go home. Of course, I had a job opportunity because at the time I was uh, asked to go back as Minister of Education because nobody else wanted to take the job. Um, so, and I was crazy enough to accept the job, not because um, I knew how to be a good Minister of Education, but because I knew that education was the most important uh, sector and that it was worth trying to change things there. And then this is how I ended up staying in Moldova. And there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of complaints here about political parties. And I understand that not everybody is going to join a political party. But I want to tell you that politics all over the world, and especially in our countries, would benefit a lot from honest people, from people who do not uh, want to get into populism, who do not want to use divisive uh, rhetoric uh, to, uh, you know, to, to get elected. Because this is very important. So what happened to me and to my colleagues while we were uh, fighting corruption in education, and this was a very big effort, and this was probably the most appreciated effort in the, during my mandate in, in the education ministry, um, we realized at some point that all the political parties in Moldova, all the political parties which uh, kind of had some popular support, uh, were corrupt. And there was no one to vote for. There was no one to trust anymore. And of course, there was no political party which would support the reforms that we initiated in education and which were needed also in other sectors. So as crazy as it sounded, we thought that we should have tried to create a political party. And believe me, I had no idea how to create a political party. I didn't have any willingness to become a politician. So I didn't plan to become a politician. Uh, we had no money. We had no media. Uh, so we had nothing. We just had the desire to see whether we can do something different. Uh, because otherwise, I should have left the country because there was no political party, there were no politicians whom we could vote for and, and hope that they will change things for better. Do you so, regret this decision, Maya? Um, well, I had no idea how difficult this was going to be. Um, so I don't know what was the decision, if I would have known how long this would take and where this would, would bring me. But I don't regret it because um, people supported us. And I'm not saying that it works 100%. It worked for us. We had to work hard. We had to create a political party during a regime which was becoming more and more authoritarian. It was risky. Uh, we had to do voluntary work for four years because we didn't have money to, uh, to pay people who work for the party. We uh, worked a lot with young people and with uh, el uh, older people because these were the only categories of people who were not afraid of the regime and of the government because the rest of the people, civil servants, people working in the private sector, they would be punished for working for the opposition. But young people, uh, like people from the high school even, and from stu uh, students from universities, they were not afraid of the regime. And then pensioners, they had nothing to lose. Um, and they were also very courageous. And that's how we managed to change things. Of course, we still have to, to make things irreversible in Moldova. But we have managed to change a lot of things. And we have started a difficult, uh, a time-consuming fight against corruption. This is never easy. But today in Moldova, we have full political support in the government, in the parliament, uh, in the majority in the parliament, and we will continue with this. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is too much at stake, and we need to try. We need to get young people into politics. We have today probably 
the uh, parliament with the biggest number of young people ever. Uh, we have a quota for women, and you know that we have 40% of our members of the parliament are women. Uh, but we also, in the political party that I established with my uh, colleagues, we have a quota uh, for parliament, uh, parliamentary members for young people. And, and we do have uh, many young people in the parliament today. Um, we do have many people in the government today, many young people in the government. And we do have some of the people uh, from diaspora who came back, uh, my advisor here, and many of my uh, colleagues who returned from abroad. Of course, this is not yet uh, uh, a critical number to, to make the change. And, and we understand, as I said, that we need to, to make a lot of efforts and a lot of uh, reforms to convince the young people, first of all, not to leave, and then at least uh, partly part of those who, who left to, to return to Moldova. But I would just encourage again the young people, people who believe in meritocracy, uh, people who uh, believe in the EU values, uh, in democracy, not to be afraid of politics and to try it. I'm not saying again that it might work 100%, but it, there is a big chance that it will work because people do appreciate, the voters do appreciate integrity. Uh, they do appreciate uh, the fact that you talk to them, um, you know, common sense. Uh, that you tell them the truth. Sometimes the truth is very difficult to, uh, to tell. For instance, when uh, we did the reforms in, educations, uh, in education and uh, the passing rate at the baccalaureate dropped from 95% to 48% because of the anti-corruption measures that we took, you can imagine that a lot of people were upset with us. Uh, parents, uh, uh, kids, but slowly they realized that this was the only way to bring justice to system because we wanted those kids who studied hard to get the best results and those who didn't study very hard uh, you know, to, to understand that they have to change uh, their attitude and, and it was not for the parents' money to substitute for their hard work. So we just need to continue, we need to be uh, more optimistic, there is a lot we need to fix. It's the climate change, it's the corruption, it's the human rights issues, um, it's the bad governance, but, uh, you know, it's the, the, the youth is to benefit the most from the efforts that we are taking today. So the youth should get more involved, in, including in politics, in governments, in parliaments, to, to make sure that the policies are right for all of us, and including from, for you. Mirjana looks skeptical. <laughs> uh, now we still have 20 minutes. Last, but definitely not least. Madam President, Katarina, uh, Greece is in European Union from 1978. Did I? Yes, some, somewhere like that. Yeah. Listening to all the panelists, uh, Madam President, what's your point of view, how would you um, explain the situation in Europe, in Greece? I presume that, you know, Greece and Slovenia do not have so many problems as the countries where the panelists are coming from, but nevertheless, every single country is facing the brain drain. Uh, Greece was heavily affected by the economical crisis in 2008. How did Greece tackle the problem of emigration and how you as a president uh, discuss the youth problematic? Thank you, so, thank you Natasha. And uh, I'm glad to be here and have the opportunity to meet with Maya, Dunya, and especially these young people. Uh, allow me to make a detour before answering to you, a small detour, because this summer Greece and Slovenia and many other countries were hit, faced some very severe climate change effects. Flood, floods here, very severe, as you told me yesterday, I didn't know the extent of it, and Greece is still facing wildfires 
uh, I think what we need is try to save, this, to face the situation, to tackle this challenge, because if we don't have a planet to live in, we cannot protect human rights or anybody. We need first, we need the planet in order to live in peace. So, and this is why, as you know, we made this declaration as presidents of Aragiolos about the Mediterranean, which is uh, our home. And I hope that we'll have a, we'll continue this way. Uh, secondly, I listened to these young people with particular interest to their interventions. And I think what they said is strongly related, this panel is strongly related to the panel yesterday, which had to do with the leaders of the Prime Ministers of Western Balkans and how has it been 20, 30 years and still the situation is not uh, accelerating so fast, their integration. Greece has always supported the integration of Western Balkans, European Union and the people in Western Balkans are going to profit. It's a win-win situation, but the more the merrier. We are better if we're all together, but also if we share the same values. It's important to share the same values. Democracy, freedom, the rule of law, all at the human rights. So, as these young people made us clear see, is that uh, people sometimes leave. It's like in uh, relations. We leave maybe sometimes because you love too much. Those young people left their countries because they loved them so much and they couldn't bear the situation. Maybe they could share and they could profit from the example of Maya. Who gave. Maybe I was thinking about it when I read uh, your interventions back home, that maybe you are the leaders of the future. These people who go, who leave and go elsewhere to find a better future. But still, of course, everybody, anybody loves where the place he is born in. Mm -hmm. So populism, nationalism, nepotism cannot, help, cannot prevent from loving your country. And it's, uh, it's really sad because, uh, well, uh, it's a verse that says that uh, the, your home is when you, the place you cry in. So everybody knows where home is. Um, I hope that in the future we'll, we'll see this situation going this way, because as I said, uh, Europe has only to gain from this integration of the Western Balkans. As for the, from the, uh, for the brain drain, it's a, I think it's a basic difference. Uh, the, uh, the youth, Greek young people, did not leave, I hope, and I and know so, from, because of this uh, lack of values in our country. I think in democracy, democracy is a, a, a challenge every day, is an everyday fight for democracy. So you never have the whole of it. It's a, but it's the best we have. So in Greece, of course, we have problems, but not so important. So mostly they left, as you said, because of the economic crisis. We had a big problem there for years and they try to have better job opportunities and uh, uh, who were comfort with their, with their qualifications. This is why they went to other countries in Europe or Canada, uh, US. And uh, the government is trying to, uh, there are some plans now from the brain gain, as they they call it, and uh, they are help trying to do so. But it takes time, because you have to have a better economy, to have a, a better solutions. And in the meantime, these young people have made their life where they are. So this is not so simple. Uh, but I hope that... Uh, and there is also another way to read it, because multilateralism and... Uh, we are all people of the same world, so... I'm glad that there are Greek young people who are living elsewhere and there are ambassadors elsewhere and they're prosper I hope they are prosperous where they live. So we must not see it only from this way. Uh, I find it, it's more important than these young people from the Western Balkan. Of course, it happens in uh, many other countries, but we're speaking about Europe now. It's important that 
uh, this human capital is not lost from their country, because you are the future. So if we all try and build a fair society and maintain it this way, and equal, and give these opportunities to grant young people, I think the things we are going to go in a better way. Madam President, what would be your advice to Moldova and the Western Balkan countries? Uh, I know what your answer is going to be, but is it the right path, the path towards European Union? Oh, yes, definitely. Why? Is European Union doing enough to um, welcome these countries? It's still, That's probably it's still, the question we it's have. It's like democracy. Sometimes. It's not example. perfect, but it's what we have. European Union is our home. We, it was created from some countries. Greece entered later, but before others. Uh, Slovenia, other countries entered in 2004. It was uh, during the Greek presidency. It was in Athens, I remember the case. We have problems still. We, we always have. There are problems wherever people are. But it's the, it's the best we have, I think. And you see, it's not... Uh, it's, not, it's, here, it's also relevant why all these migrants try to come mm -hmm. from other places. It's not only economy. It's, a, it's a, the values that the society shares. I think it's my opinion that it's the values also that are important for, for Europe. So I visited Kyiv and Borodyanka and Bucha um, some months ago. And uh, what Maya said is it's not only for Moldova, Ukrainian are fighting for all of us, because they're fighting for European values. Of course, they're fighting for their country, their uh, uh, independence, but actually, it's the, so if they want to be a part of the European Union, yes, we must all have us have, be together, yes. As long as we share the values, and that's why the Majority of the people have to share. It's also the democracy. Uh, we don't need the total. Definitely. It's, I yes. often we say share, we, we, we respect minorities. We, sp <laughs> sure. we respect, yes. So we respect everyone's opinion. But the majority, yes, it's good to have these values. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, ten minutes to the end. I will now offer you a possibility to ask questions to my distinguished panelists. Do you have any questions? If you don't, we can, you know, <laughs> continue the discussion for hours and hours. But if you do not have any questions, I will provoke one lady that I see here in the audience to explain her story. My dear friend, Emilia, you came from North Macedonia as well. She's today a minister in Slovenian government. And please, just briefly, what was your reason to leave your country? I know. <laughs> Hello, so I'm Emilia. Um, I, I will come to you. And I almost cried when Miriana was speaking. Uh, I came to Slovenia exactly 21 years ago. It was uh, 28th of August, it was yesterday. Uh, I also wrote a post yesterday about that. The reasons were the same, just like you were speaking all. And you were saying uh, both countries are your countries, but at the end, none of the country is your country because it's exactly what you mentioned. The people in your country uh, don't like you because you left the country and you're not helping them. And in your new country, I love Slovenia, but I will never be a Slovenian as hard as I try. <laughs> And it's really, really difficult. It's not that I don't like to go to Macedonia, but the values there are still not. Yesterday, I was very disappointed, and the commissioner mentioned that. And my state secretary is from Bosnia, so we really understand how it feels. And we were exchanging taxes. Nothing changed. 30 years after, nothing really changed. And there is no future, because after today's discussion, there is no one young people living in Macedonia, in Bosnia, in uh, Serbia, Croatia, I will not list all the countries now, that would like to stay in their country. It's about the values. Yeah, I came here to school, <laughs> uh, but I really came here because I couldn't see a future in my country. And now I cannot see 
a future in that country for my children. I, I don't want them to live in a country like that. I really hope that this will change. And again, with Aida yesterday, we were exchanging. We hope that 30 years later, we are not going to sit in the same room and listening to the same discussions. I'll give you a hug. She's crying a bit right now, but I know those are the tears of... Uh, how can I call your tears? The tears of not sadness, but the tears of not having enough power to change things. You, you, you were saying, you know, 30 years has pa have passed and nothing, nothing has changed. It hurts, and I see it hurts you more than it hurts myself because you have a different experience than I do. Uh, let's wrap up. We have 10 minutes more. I will give a floor to each one of you for one minute just to give me your final reasoning, uh, maybe your final thought. What do you think is the most important thing for young people to be changed in your countries, in European Union, around the globe? We didn't have time to tackle planet changes, climate, climate crisis that we are facing right now, but I am advocating all the time that we have to do something for the, for, for the gen generations which are coming you know, uh, after us. We do not own this planet. We inherited this planet and we have to do something without young people. <sighs> Again, there is not much to be done if you are going to be quiet. Let's start here. Mirjana, the final word from your side. Yes, um, it's been really a fruitful debate, so I'll uh, really keep it um, short. I believe that uh, beside all the obvious reasons for which personally I'm not living anymore in my home country, I believe that there is still a hope and I believe there is still an optimism because if young people engage and if we create a more compassionate uh, society where we have more mutual respect and trust to one another, uh, with each other, I believe uh, changes can be made. So solidarity, trust, and mutual understanding. This, I believe, are the foundations we must build upon. Thank you. And Thank not you. giving up, if I understand yes. the background of your tone. Yes, definitely. Nina, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I just want to address two, two things that I have heard. Uh, first is the political participation. I fully agree. There should be more. But when one in a country has such a fatigue of political process and nobody uh, and the youth does not have trust in the institutions, and uh, as we heard last night in the, in the speech, trust is something that we must have. And when that's not, not present, uh, it, it makes the situ situation a little bit harder because from what I know, most of the youth don't even believe in a, in a notion of democracy or don't even understand what democracy truly is. Uh, I believe that must be changed uh, uh, for the, the things to get better. And uh, we need to, even though we have, uh, our, our country is plagued with many, many, many different problems, they cannot dictate our future forever. We cannot let that happen. And at the end, I want to conclu conclude, as long as the political stagnation, corruption, and uh, antiquated system of belief relating to the human rights and the values, I fully agree. Most of the migrants consider themselves economic migrants. For my case, that's not the, not, not, it's not the case. Uh, as, as, as long as these things persevere, brain drain will do. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Madam President, Maya, your conclusion? Well, I am optimistic. That's why I continue Ooh. to fight. Um, and I do believe that we need to, uh, to believe and to try again and again, because this is our world. I do believe it's very dangerous that we take democracy for granted. I do believe it's very dangerous that we do not, I mean, that people do not understand, and especially young people don't understand what democracy is. Uh, I do believe that sometimes we speak in very general terms and we need to learn to speak in simple terms. I find this difficult for myself as a politician when I go and have to explain to people why we have to support Ukraine uh, because we have to defend the values because a democratic state is about respecting uh, and uh, valuing the life of every single citizen and that an authoritarian regime cannot be good for the people. Uh, it's difficult when you need to show that democracy delivers despite the very difficult context. And one thing that I've learned from Moldova's transition is that 
To be able to strengthen the support, the public support for democracy, you need to be able to deliver on economy, uh, on economic opportunities. Um, so we just need to uh, understand better what's the language of the young people. They need to, we need to help each other, uh, but we need uh, more involvement from the young people. It's, it's really about their world, and the young people are not the future, they are the present, present also. Madam President, Katerina, thank you, Maya. I will just give you an intro sentence. Are young people in Greece interested in politics? And then the wrap up, please, from your side. Not as much as they should, yes. It would be best, I think, but because fatigue is everywhere and the political system does not always gain, uh, you know, faith from young people because they see the problems. But also it's very uh, sane that young people are protesting and uh, discuss discussing things more and sharing if, of course, they are strong supporters of values. And I strongly believe, and it's maybe it's a part of an answer for the Western Balkans, that it's time for the younger generation to pass to the leadership. The leader, when the leadership comes to the younger generation, maybe the answers were, uh, will be more, much easier. We, they have to you know, stop the relation with the past, some of these countries. Um, you were really very right, Katerina, to mention climate change, and I'm really sorry that we do not have more time to elaborate on that. Are young people in Greece yes. interested enough to do something to help our planet? Yes. That's Especially young probably, people. Um, it's all about young people at the end. Mm -hmm. Are there enough like NGOs? Are the politicians discussing this with young people? Yes. And maybe this is what gives us hope, yes. Especially young people, and they're pushing the political system to do so. So I think it's... Uh, so there's, there is still light at the end of the tunnel in... On, on our planet, but it's, it's on youth, it's on young people, yes, okay. Dunia, your wrap up. You've heard what would you recommend, suggest yeah. to us and to the audience? I mean, the, the rain is falling, so I'm thinking of all the people that lost their homes, um, and then my thoughts are really, um, again, on the environment, um, and what is happening here in Slovenia, what is happening in Greece, and, and in many other parts. And then, you know, my uh, additional thoughts are on youth. They are the driving force uh, behind everything related to environment. Um, sorry, politicians are more just talking about the environment, but they are walking. They are the ones defending rivers, they are the ones defending our mountains, um, and uh, all those wonderful places that are um, in great danger now. So if the politicians lose their sight uh, of the importance of the environment for future generations and for young people, including children that we are forgetting most of the time, because they are also the ones um, that are shaping uh, the world uh, with their sort of thoughts on the environment. Um, so we go back to uh, literacy and the way we will uh, also make sure that uh, people are making sure that children and future generations are equipped enough in order to understand the dangers. You, so, you mentioned, Dunia, sorry, I have mm -hmm. to speed up the process, um, education. Mm -hmm. And I will pass the word here to uh, the young bright man from Bosnia, Vahid. You said that you tried to travel around your country and get rid of the prejudice about the ethnic origin. But the biggest problem in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as far as I see, was the educational system after the war that Serbs were going to Serbian schools, Croats were going to Croatian schools, Bosniaks were going to Bos Bosniak school. So this was a clear mistake from my point of view, but please, Correct me if I'm wrong and wrap up your final thought, please. Yes, you are right. Uh, we still have two schools under one roof. Uh, honestly, if I was younger, maybe I would even bomb that school because that is the crux of the problem in, in, my, in my country. Uh, yes, I, I managed to, 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 to break the ice with a lot of people around, around my country 
just by being myself. Once they, that they see that my idea is stronger than my name, as I mentioned, then they uh, look me in the eye. Chinese have this beautiful saying, my, my friend uh, told me once during the dinner, that if a Chinese looks you in the eye during the dinner whole time, it means that you have a friend for a li lifetime. And that is what we need, to protect the humanity. D Ms. Dunya mentioned children. Protect those childhood vi values in yourself. Just make a comparison between today's panel and yesterday's. It is wise man doesn't need more. You can look in the eyes of the panelists and you will see you will see the difference. You will see that there is solidarity and there is humanity, and it is worth the fight for it. Thank you. Thank you. It's time to conclude. I know that we could continue for, for some more time. But, you know, for the end, I would just like to say a quote from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I often use it. It's really a meaningful one. He said, our lives will end the day when we become silent about the things that matter. And this is what I want to pass to you as a president of the Republic of Slovenia. You've heard many stories. And just one more sentence to really end. We do not need less Europe. We need more Europe. Thank you to all of you and especially thank you to my distinguished guests. Good luck.